So yesterday, I asked the question, so what's different this time? Well, one of the things that's different this time is Jerry McCaughey. He has done this before, and he's been very successful at it. In 1990, he started up Century Homes in a small factory in a small town in Ireland. By 2005, Century Homes had three large factories in Ireland and two more in the UK, and were producing 8,000 houses a year. They were the largest off-site builder in Europe. Jerry sold Century Homes, and now he's doing it all over again in California with Integra. I'll let Jerry take it from here. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome yet another pioneer, Jerry McCaughey. Good morning, everyone. Um, just to, to um, put a little bit more flesh on what, what Art said, Integra is actually, I suppose, in, one way, in many ways, my family's third iteration in the offsite industry. I was probably connected directly to offsite from the moment I was born because my dad, believe it or not, was a carpenter who worked in the United States back in the 50s, came back to Ireland, and liked the idea of wood frame construction. I thought he would bring that to a country that was building everything out of concrete blocks. But despite the fact that he'd been working as a stick framer in the United States, when he came back to Ireland, it never even crossed his mind that you would actually build a wood frame house on a building site. So he built a factory to start making wood frame houses in 1964. So I've been sort of directly or indirectly connected with the offset industry for that period of time. So I also want to put this back to slight disagreement with, with what Michael put it. Offside construction has been around for a long time, and it has been very, very successful in other parts of the world. It's North America that's the issue. It's not offside construction. That's a fact. So we need to be careful in saying that. We talk about here about what we're going to do in the future. I mean, a lot of what we're talking about doing here has actually already been done. So another example of that being, we did the world's first six-story wood frame building back in the year 2000. It was built, by, built with a, co a combination of companies in the UK and Ireland at BRE Cardington in the UK. You still, in, as far as I know, in the United States, whatever about Canada, the United States still haven't built a six-story wood frame building here. But it just goes to prove the point that it can be done, and it has been done. Other thing I would say is, <clears throat> When you look at wood frame, when you look around the world, I mean, wood frame construction itself may not be the most common method of construction in a lot of countries. But if you take in Europe in particular, where wood frame is built, probably 90 to 100 percent of it is built off-site, because no European really comes to the idea that you can actually build something on-site as efficiently as you can in a factory. It's like if you left here now and you walked out to the BMW dealer and you said, I, I'd like to get a new car, I want to buy a 5 Series, and the dealer said to you, well, I'll give you two options, sir or madam. I can have all the parts shipped to your front yard, and I can have three guys come out in a pickup truck with some welding gear and pneumatic tools and start assembling it in your front yard, or I can have it made in, in BMW's factory in Bavaria. You're not even going to wait to respond to the guy because you're going to think he is, he's, he's off his medication. Why? would you build it in your front yard when you can get it done in a factory? And I ask this question. Think of one industry in the world where they think that using the same process they used 100 years ago is normal to do today, other than construction. There isn't one. But I still want to make that point before we start. Offsite is around, has been around, and has been very successful. And a lot of what's been talked about this to happen in the United States industry at the moment is already tried, tested, and proven. Part of the problem with the United States is, and North America in general, is they don't put the radar up and look around what the rest of the world is doing. The largest house builder in the world is Sexui House. Sexui have some of the biggest automated off-site off plants in the world, and they've been doing it for generations. My father set up the first wood frame automated facility in Ireland back in 1964. I set up one in 1990, and now I've done it again. So this, is, this has been around. 
This is actually not new. It's, it's a tried, tested method of, of, of building buildings. One of the things that, that uh, I suppose gets a little bit of confusion, and you, you'll hear terms thrown around in the industry about uh, when it comes to offset, about component, panelized, prefab, modular, precast, volumetric. And they're, people are using them interchangeably and not knowing exactly what they are. Well, they're all terms within offsite, but they're all separate. So I get my, my company, which is, we say, fully integrated offsite solutions, which is more about advanced panelization, being called modular. Well, we're not modular. Modular is a great product, by the way, but people need to understand there are different types of products within offsite construction. We probably fall into all three of these the use of component panelized prefab which then falls into this fully integrated offsite solution. So I wanted to talk about that in particular today. And unlike where, where Michael was talking, there's a lot of uh, office type commercial buildings and, and, and large multifamily. We're primarily concerned with the production home builders in the single family market. But this probably to me is the most key aspect of offsite construction that gets missed. People think, generally, when they talk about offsite construction, they think about the bottom part of that slide. They think about components and elements. Offsite construction is not a hard product. It's a process. The hard product that comes out of it is the output of a process. It's not the product itself. Because what offsite construction does is it forces the people involved in the industry to change the way they think about building the building. And that's where the primary gain is gained in efficiency, in the change in the thinking, not in the use of the component. The component is merely an output. We would actually say that the components themselves probably only amount to about 20% of the total product. So the product, you have to think of the product of offsite, whatever type of product that is, you have to think about it in, in terms of, it's a combination of a hard product and a soft product. The hard product you see, which are the components, the elements that go on site, and the soft product, which is the biggest part of it, is the process change itself. And that's what offsite really does, is it forces a process change within the organizations and all the stakeholders and all the people who are involved in building a building. And it's getting all of those people together to think about the process in a different way. And the title of my, of, of my presentation was, if it's not a system, it's not a solution. And that's the reason why I say that. It's a systematic change to the way you approach the building. And that involves getting everybody who's involved who touches that building together in a room before you ever go to site. Because one of the most common and, and annoying expressions that's used again in, in residential construction in the US is, it gets worked out in the field. That's just a euphemism for I don't know. Now, it sounds funny, but, but you're paying an architect or an engineer to come up with details to build a building. And he's writing things on the drawing field measure, or it gets worked out in the field. No disrespect to any architects in here, but what the hell are you doing if you don't know how that's going to work before it goes to site? The site is not the R&D facility. That should have already been done before it ever gets there. And it's changing this process around to people saying, it does not get worked out on the site. It gets worked out in an office somewhere on a computer. So that everybody knows exactly how that building is going to go together. So when you look at the process itself, the various different elements that are, that, that are involved in it, well, what, what happens? Well, I know what I'm saying in relative importance, but certainly one of the most important parts of the whole process change that takes place is in the area of design and engineering. And that, again, goes back to the situation that you have to work it out before it ever goes to the site. What that means, and I, 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 I hate cliches and acronyms like this, but in reality, as well as one of the most common words that's used now in, in, in a lot of the, the, the trade shows that are, that are around construction in North America is collaboration. And that's true, I and mean, that's really what offsite does. 
it enforces a discipline on the players that are involved in the building to get together, to bring the information together, to really operate as a team. Because at the moment, the analogy I would say about the way most buildings are built in, in North America is it's pretty much like a relay race. The next guy can't start off until the last guy hands him over the baton. When he hands him over the baton, the last guy says, my job's done, not my problem, yours now. So you have this elongated sequential process to build a building with everybody abdicating responsibility once they've got their piece done. It does not take a brain surgeon to figure out that that is an incredibly inefficient and dangerous way to build a building. And all it ever leads to is finger pointing. Well, what offsite construction does, it brings everybody together as a team. So rather than running that relay race one after another, actually, all, all, if it's a four, four, uh, four-handed race, all four are running at the same time, or at least they're starting off at staggered stages, but they're helping each other, they're looking at each other, they're bringing their information together early on in the process and not waiting till the next one figures it out. And a good example of that, which is, again, completely different to my experience in Europe, is... <laughs> Until we started up in the US, I never, I, I'd never come across a situation where architects were either leaving dimensions off drawings or the dimension on the drawing, when you looked at it, was completely incorrect. And when you go back to them and you said, well, we really only work to the nearest inch. That does not work in offsite construction, particularly when you're using high levels of automation because the machine is not going to interpret anything. The dimension that's on that drawing has to be the dimension that's going to be used in the building of the building because the CAM file that's going to the machine is going to tell the machine exactly what to do. So the quality of the drawings, the quality of the information, all has to be raised. And again, that's part of what I'm talking about in terms of the process improvement. It raises everybody up to a higher standard. And that's what leads to a higher quality build. Together, everyone achieves more. And it is working together. So again, go back to the design and engineering part, part of this. This is probably the hardest part in terms of changing the mindset of the people who are involved in the building of a building to understand the concentration and the effort that has to go into this stage of it. Bringing everything into a full 3D model, in our case, and again, I said, we're primarily focused on single family residential to the production home builders. But one of the first tasks that we do is get the concrete guys, the plumber and electrician, HVAC, um, and any other trade that we can think of that touches off that building into a room before we start. And we want their details and their information. Even though we're not supplying them, we want that information. The reason being is because we can now incorporate that into our drawing, and we can see where all the clashes are in that building. So this thing of it gets worked out in the field doesn't have to happen, because we've worked it out in, a, in, a, in an office before anything ever went to a machine, before anything ever went, went onto, the, onto the site. So getting people to understand that you have to have the information up front, and that has been probably one of the most difficult parts of this, because asking a plumber or an electrician, even a plumber simply, to take a drawing and tell you where he's going to put his pipes and where he's going to run them, where, he's, where his wastes are going to go from upstairs to downstairs. Most of them will look at you as if you have two heads when you ask them that, because they do, they do not want to do it until they get to the site. But again, that's, that's part of the problem in the process. The people are not doing things in advance. They're waiting until they're physically on the site. So getting to realize there's a process change going on, and this information has to be got up front, is a critical, par critical part of this. And getting the, the, the builder involved to ensure that he's helping us enforce that discipline. And that's what I say, it's enforcing a discipline among the other people who touch off the, touch off the building. And then this, where, this is where, where, where all of this leads, where, where the problems will occur. That piece of machinery cannot interpret anything. It will only do what it's told to do. So if an architect leaves, or a structural engineer leaves a dimension off a, building, off a drawing, there's no chance to work it out on site. That machine needs to know where it is. 
And so going back to try to get people to understand early in the process, get the information early in the process, think about, for example, we have situations where here in North America, an architect will draw a drawing and he'll take the, for, a, for a window opening and all he'll really do is give you a center point and say you work it out from there. In other words, he's not going to find out what the dimensions are for the windows or what the tolerances are for the windows. That's basically somebody else's job. I have never come across that until I came to North America. In Europe, the architect would be responsible for even going back to the builder, going somewhere, finding the information and what window type is going in that building and then incorporating those tolerances into that drawing. Because again, as I said earlier on, offsite construction is the norm in Europe when it comes to wood frame construction. So people are used to the fact that it's going to go to an automated piece of equipment and that information needs to be on it. So we have to go around now and change the view, the view of the architects and the engineers here to make sure they're putting the correct information on it and they're not leaving it just to somebody else. In other words, it's like the relay race. It's somebody else's problem further down the line. I've done my piece. It's not pushed down the line. It has to be pulled forward in the line. Even down to delivery. Thinking about the process itself, it's the whole way through from your design engineering, your manufacturing, but even when you get to the site, that trailer is loaded in such a way that, it, that it's sequentially offloaded, that every panel, we can either take everything off and drop it on the ground and the trailer can go away, or we can take every panel off that in sequential order and place them on the site. So somebody's thinking, in a factory, before they put it on that trailer, how are those panels going to come off that truck so as they can go up as efficiently as possible on the building site? I mean, think about that. Somebody has to think now about what's going to happen with the trades on the site in relation to the panels at the back of that truck in order to get the maximum efficiency on the site. So the process is being thought through. At this point now, I'm going, to, I'm going to actually show you a video which, just to, to again, the, the point of this video is more, is one of the, one of the hottest topic, topics in the industry at the moment is there's a labor shortage. Now, think about this. North America is building 1.25 million homes per year. The 30-year run rate is 1.5. So we're a quarter of a million homes below the normalized level we're reaching an affordability issue, and you could argue for, I mean, as Michael quite rightly said, I mean, there's a whole lot of cost involved. One of the other issues is, if you don't build enough, the supply and demand curve set will say the prices will go up. You can't build the houses as well if you, can, if you don't have the labor to build it. But people are going around saying, are, are use, and builders are using this as an excuse, so we don't have enough labor, we don't have enough labor. But as I said to you at the very beginning, think of another industry that thinks that building today, the same way as it did 100 years ago, 200 years ago, is normal. You think about an industry here that hasn't changed, and they say, I mean, my, my view is, if the current building process you're using is labor constrained, and you can't change the labor constraint, then change the building process. That's what every other industry would do. But the US residential house building industry, and some other countries around the world the same way, think that, no, we'll keep using the same outdated process and keep complaining about the fact that we don't have enough labor, when in reality, the problem is the process. And the profit is in the process, and the solution is in the process. Or I should say, in the change of the process. So we'll go to this video now, which is a two and a, so it's a two and a half thousand square foot house that was put up by four men. Uh, I'll tell you more than that to, to, to actually see it.
So you can understand why I get a little bit passionate when, when I hear people saying there's a labour crisis. When you, can put, when you can put a house up in that speed with that few people, there's no crisis. And, and these are the figures that actually prove the point. On average in California at the moment, that same house is taking 15 days on site to frame or 71 man days. We did it in 14 man days. That equates to a 507% increase in productivity. This is not arbitrary or hypothetical. This is a fact. My dad has been doing this for 50 years. I've been doing it for over 30 years. In fact, in, in, in Ireland, when we were putting these houses up, we'd have actually put the roof on on the same day because we wouldn't have had the problems with, 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 with the, some of the strapping and the hold downs because of the seismic issue you have to deal with in California. So the solution to the to the so-called labour crisis is clearly there, it's clearly visible, there's a clear solution and it is not a hypothetical, it's not a test, it's not, a, it's not an R&D project, it's something that the rest of the world does every single day. Today in Europe, there's a bunch, there's hundreds if not thousands of houses going up this way. And yet, I get called an innovator or a disruptor in the US. Back in Ireland, I'm just another one of those guys. It's just the way it's done. So, there's also a problem where the industry itself thinks that the United States is the center of the world and doesn't look out. And I'm saying that now as a US citizen myself, but we've got to start looking outside at what other people do and what their solutions are. But some of the other ancillary benefits of offsite construction, which don't really get focused on enough, they're said from time to time, but people really don't focus on them, is actually the quality improvement, and achieve, quality improvement that you can actually get from factory controlled production. You simply cannot get that kind of quality on a regular basis on a building site. And we've had, somebody mentioned about code inspectors, about, or about inspectors themselves. We have actually had zero problem with inspectors and regulators in the US market. Because we go through a process with them of educating them, bringing them to the factory, showing them the production, showing them our design and engineering, working the way through it, answering their queries, walking hand in hand with them through it. In fact, we've had the exact opposite. We've had some of the city saying, listen, is it okay if we come to your plant now and do the inspection there? And we don't even need to do all of them. We just come on, on, on an irregular basis. We do the inspection there and that'll, that'll free up our people so we don't have to go and inspect every time on site. Because they're saying themselves, they can see the quality gains and the improvements that can be made using factory controlled conditions. To the people here who, who are in the wood industry itself. This is one of my pet peeves, and it's certainly one of the things that, that, that has come, uh, shocked us when we got here, was the low quality of the lumber that was available to us. Highly automated equipment requires high quality material. You will stop the machine if you put bent, twisted, highly knotted material, stuff with a weigh-in into, into a machine. It cannot take that kind of material. The industry itself, to take advantage of the move towards offsite construction in the US, needs to improve the quality of the material that it's supplying the providers. And that is, a, that is a big issue. It is not to be underestimated because if you have to go out and pay a premium, which we do at the moment, to get higher quality material, it can make you less competitive than you would otherwise be. But there's no reason for the industry to be supplying, in many cases, the low quality of the lumber, particularly stud material that it is supplying. Some of the other advantages are that particular trailer that you saw that pulled up on that site, that's actually the waste that was left on that house. You couldn't fill a domestic bin with the waste from the construction of the one where there was a picture of the, of the, of the trailer fully loaded. Because if you don't bring waste to site, you don't generate waste on site. So there is nothing to, there is nothing to put away. Now when they get up to the roof and they're sheeting the roof and they're cutting the OSB for the roof, you'll get waste at that point. But up to plate level, there's no waste. There's nothing, there's nothing to be wasted. So you get the benefit of less waste, which, is a, which in many ways means it's a more sustainable build, but it's also saving the builder probably about $400 per house on his waste costs. You get a safer working environment, which It can be important to some people, and some people don't, don't pass much remarks on it. 
to us it's very important, but you definitely get a far safer working environment using an offsite, using offsite construction. The fact that you're even using a crane means that there's less stress and pressure put on the people who are actually working on a site on a day-to-day -day basis because the crane's doing all, all the heavy lifting for them. You get less environmental impacts. You get less, actually, particularly, noise is one of the things because in lots of, some of the sites that we're doing that are infill, um, one of the issues is you'll have people who've, who are housed there and they have young kids in them and their baby's trying to sleep during the day. With our, our system, we're up in one day and all you hear is the pit pit of a, of a nail gun every couple of, every couple of minutes. But you don't have saws going the whole time and compressors going the whole time. It's a far more and quieter way to build, so less environment, negative environmental impact. <coughs> Sorry, the first one was meant to say that there was less people on site, which in, and this one's to do with safety, so I've covered both of those. And the other is you have very little weather-related delays because the building's up so fast and weather tight that there's um, very little impact that the, weather, that the weather has on you. Once you can get your slab in, you can build. And I just left it for Q&A. I don't know if there's any time for that order or not. But anyway, thank you very much. <clears throat>